Hi, in this video I will show you Unity's new UI creation and development tool, the UI Toolkit. For those who are still unfamiliar with it, especially UI artists in the field, it will be an opportunity to foresee the future changes in the production. The UI Toolkit is Unity's third generation UI. Unity says their new UI system is inspired by web technology. Typically, three languages, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, are used together to create web pages. The UI Toolkit takes a similar approach. A new language called UXML is responsible for structure and layout, just like HTML, and USS is for style, and the C Sharp plays the role of JavaScript. Let's experience how these structural changes affect the UI work process through making a simple but working UI. A new project is created and a scene is prepared. The scene contains a space-themed background made of a particle system. First of all, create a UXML file which will contain the information about a UI structure and layout. In order to draw our UI on top of the scene, we need some settings in the scene. Create an empty game object and add a UI document component and then connect the UXML file to the source asset field of the component. There is a warning sign. It says a panel settings asset is required. Panel settings defines how the UI is rendered on the screen. You could think of it as the canvas in UGUI. Create a panel settings asset. You can see a lot of properties in the inspector from style to sorting order. Leave all the default settings as they are except one. It's the scale mode right here. It decides how to resize our UI according to the screen aspect ratio. You may think of the canvas scaler in UGUI because this example uses a fixed resolution, 1920 by 1080. Here select constant pixel size. Connect the newly created panel settings asset to the component. We have finished all the settings in the scene. Double click the UXML file to open the UI builder. In the hierarchy pane on the left is the UXML file I just created. This is where the hierarchy of the UI is shown. It's different from the editor's hierarchy. In the editor, all the game objects in a scene are listed, but only the elements that make up the UI are listed here. The library pane at the bottom shows all the available UI elements. You can see familiar names like label, button, toggle and so on. After a while, we are going to create a UI using those elements. The viewport pane in the center is where you can see the UI at work. There is one thing to check here, the theme. Initially, the UI builder was used to create editor extensions and it's still being used for that purpose. So when creating a runtime UI, make sure that the Unity default runtime theme is selected. Otherwise, the UI may look a little different at runtime. Then I will match the screen size and canvas size in the inspector. When creating individual UI controls, you can manually enter the size here. If your UI covers the entire screen like now, check the Match Game View checkbox. It'll resize the UI to match the game view resolution. The canvas background below allow you to set a backdrop for your UI. You can assign a color or load an image. If you select the camera menu at the end and select the main camera of the current scene, the game view is rendered beneath your UI. Drag a visual element from the library to the hierarchy. The visual element is the most basic building block in the UI toolkit. It plays the role of UGUI's game object and image component together. If you are familiar with HTML, you might think of div tag. Though a new visual element is listed in the hierarchy, I can't see it in the viewport. That's because properties like size and color don't have any values yet. With the visual element selected, go to the inline styles in the inspector. This is where you set the style of a visual element such as its size, color, layout and so on. Go to the background and change the color to red. It's still invisible because it doesn't have any size value yet. Go to size above and enter 300 for width and height. A red square appears in the upper left corner of the canvas. If the UI is not updated in the game view, play the scene briefly. Next we make this square cover the entire screen. It'll be the parent of all the UI elements we're going to make. You can change the size by dragging the handle on the viewport, or you can directly enter the size corresponding to the screen resolution. There is a more convenient way. It's using percentages, not pixels. If you enter 100% for the width and height, 
you can create a visual element that completely covers the entire screen as the its resolution changes. I just got a message that match game view was disabled. It's because I changed the resolution. In this case, you need to go back to canvas and check the match game view box again. Change the color of the visual element to transparent and add a new visual element as a child below it. Specify size and color. Copy that visual element. Change the color and make two more copies. When you copy game objects view GUI, they are stacked overlapping in the same location. However, in UI Toolkit, elements are stacked from top to bottom as if using a vertical layout group. The reason lies with the parent. There's a flex section in the inspector. This is where you manage the layout of the children. In web, several other modes are supported other than flex, but Unity supports only flex mode at the moment. First, let's look at the flex's direction property. The arrow icon on the button is pointing down its column, so the copied elements are stacked vertically. If you change to row, they are arranged horizontally. And if you change the setting of align items or justify content, you can also change how they are aligned in the cross axis or main axis. Looking at the design of our UI, the screen is largely divided into two parts, top and bottom. Delete no longer necessary elements that we made for the test. Set both of the parents align items and justify content to flex start. Select the first child. Set it to 100% in width and 50% in height so that it always occupies the top 50% of the screen. The visual element at the bottom is also set to 100% width and 50% height. Change the color of each. The top is transparent, the bottom is white. It's time to place an astronaut and a robot to match our design. Add two visual elements as children of the top one. The astronaut image is going to be animated in the next video. We'll find the astronaut with its name. So give it a name that can be easily recognized. Load the prepared image in background. Then enter the width and height in size. It's time to place the images. In our design, an astronaut and a robot stand facing each other. The flex properties of the parent decides whether to stack the children vertically or horizontally. In the parent's flex, select row. Now the two images are facing each other horizontally instead of vertically. It's time to bring the two images down to the floor. In Align Items, select Flex End. Two images lowered to the floor are glued to the left side of the screen. This is because the Justify Content property are left in the default state, Flex Start. To make these two images face each other with proper spacing based on the vertical center line, we need to use Space Between or Space Around. Try Space Between. The two images got stuck at either end of the screen. Space Between is an option to place the children at regular spacing. But now since there are only two children, they are stuck to both ends of the screen. Select the space around instead. Space around is an option that allows children to have equal space both left and right. That's why you can have equal spacing towards both ends. With the flex layout, the UI toolkit can make UIs that respond to various resolutions. At the bottom we need a title text, body text and a button to open a pop-up. Take two labels and one button from library and attach them as the children of the bottom visual element. We will increase the font size of the label, increase the size to about 80. Insert the text prepared in advance into the label. To put text in the label, enter the desired text in the text field of the inspector. In the same way, select the label for the body and paste the prepared string into the text field. In this case, it would be nice to have a long text that can have line breaks. After inserting the text, increase the font size to about 36. For line wrapping, under the text section, select Normal instead of the No Wrap. Enter 100 in the button's height. Change the color to white and increase the size to about 45. Change the color to blue in background. As in the design, let's make a rounded button. In UGUI, a texture is required for a rounded button. However, in the UI toolkit, a rounded button can be made without a texture, as it can be done in the web design. 
You only need to specify radius. Enter 20 in radius. The button in the design was a fully rounded one. Enter 50 for the height, which is half of 100 in height. Let's zoom in. You can see a thin gray line drawn around the button. This is because border's width has a default value. Change the width to zero. There is one thing to note here. Even though the button is enlarged, pixels are not broken like when the bitmap image is enlarged. When Unity says that you can create UI without texture, it's what they're talking about. All the necessary UI elements at the bottom are ready. Select the parent visual element and go to Align's Justify Content. The layout in the example seems impossible because the three elements are separated. Add two visual elements below the parent and put the title and body label into one visual element and the button into another. Then select space between from Justify Content. In this way, you can create two large groups. Let's add some empty space around those groups. For distinction, I will name each label title and paragraph. Proper empty space in your layout has a huge impact on both readability and visibility. In order to create empty space in UI Toolkit, you need to understand the concept of margin and padding. Select paragraph and create a 4 pixel thick outline in border. Go to margin and padding, enter 0 to override the default style's values. Enter 20 for margin. 20 pixels of space around the label is created. More precisely, the space is outside the border. Margin means the space outside the border. Then this time, let's put 20 in padding as well. Another 20 spaces are added outside the label. However, if you look more closely, this space is inside the red border. Contrary to margin, padding refers to the space inside the border. In the UI toolkit, padding is shown in light green and margin in light orange color. Let's create proper spacing between the elements. Revert the tested part. Make top and bottom paddings of 40 for the title. Then make top and bottom paddings of 20 for the paragraph. Though proper spacing for the top and bottom is made, it still fills the screen completely on the left and right. Add padding of 80 on the left and right. Reset the default margin and padding of the button to zero. If you look at the example, buttons also have appropriate spacing around it. Go to the button's parent. Enter 100% in width to fill the screen horizontally. Enter 240 pixels for height, not a percentage. You can put values in pixels by appending PX after the number. Select Center in Justify Content to center the button and add a padding of 60 on the left and right. Finally, we add a padding of 40 top and bottom of the parent. Now it should look pretty much like the example. This has introduced you to the basics of working with layouts in the UI toolkit. Typography and fonts are an integral part of UI, so let's take a quick look at how UI Toolkit uses fonts. I prepared a regular font and a bold font. Select Font Asset Creator from the top menu. Put the prepared font in Source Font field at the top. Create a font atlas without touching any other settings, then save to a file. Make another font asset for the bold font in the same way. In Project Pane, there are two font assets. Select the regular font asset. If you look in the inspector, there is a section called Font Weights. Connect the bold font asset created earlier to the bold field. This makes it easy to apply bold style in UI Builder. Next, go to Generation Settings. Change the Atlas Population Mode from Static to Dynamic. And check Multi Atlas Textures. Click the Apply button. Set the bold font in the same way. To use the desired font in UI Builder, first select a label. If you go to text in the inspector, there is a font asset field where you can select the font asset you want. You can change the font and see that the bold style is applied. However, in UI Toolkit, there is another way other than applying fonts to individual labels. Undo the font change and go to the topmost visual element. And apply the font to the visual element. You can see that the title and paragraphs font have been changed. The reason for this is that UI Toolkit has adopted the cascade style system used in web development. The font applied at the top node is applied to all elements below it. Therefore, if you want to change the font in this UI, you do not have to find and change each label one by one. Just change the font only in the top visual element. 
and if you want to use a different font only for a specific label, apply the font only to the label. Apply bold style to title and button. It is not impossible in the UGUI, but having the cascade style system seems to be a clear advantage. Run the scene and see what's been made so far. The UI is drawn well in the game as it was in the UI builder. However, there is one regret. There is no response at all when the button is clicked. Let's make the button respond when it's hovered over or clicked. To do this, we need to understand the concept of style and style sheet, which are the core features of the UI toolkit. Select the button and go to Inspector. I made a button like this using various properties in inline style. However, there are things I didn't tell you. In the Inspector, some properties have a white line in front of them. The white line means the property's default value is overridden with another value. These overridden properties and their values are saved along with structure and layout information in UXML. Open the UXML file in Visual Studio or any other document editing program. If you look at the code, there is a part called UI button. This is the very button we added in UI Builder. After text, there is another button in quotation marks. This is the string we put in the button's label. Height 100 pixel is the height assigned to the button. All the overridden properties are here. Styles stored in UXML are called inline styles. Let's restore the values stored in inline style back to their default ones. Right click the property's name and select unset. If the unset is done well, the white line and the related code in UXML will disappear. In fact, if you look at the viewport, the button's height has returned to the default value and the related code has gone in UXML as well. If you enter 100 again, a white line will appear. And if you save in this state, it will be saved as inline style. This inline style has the advantage of being quick to apply when needed. However, in order to maintain the consistency of the UI style, the use of a style sheet is recommended. Let's take a quick look at how to create a style sheet and how to use it. First, go to the style sheet in the top left corner of the UI build. Press the plus button and select Create new USS. The USS file appears in the style sheet pane. Now it contains nothing. I'm going to move the button's inline style to the style sheet. Go to the style sheet section in the inspector. Enter the name of the new style class in the empty field. Then press the extract inline styles to new class button. A new style class is registered in the style sheets class list. All the white lines in front of the properties disappeared. Instead, the selector of the style class appeared in the style sheet. Let's take a look at the UXML file and the use file as well. Previously, there was a long code about the button style, but they are all gone, and only the newly created style class's name is there. By this name, the details from the style sheet are applied to the UI elements. Then, if you go to the USS file, the things previously in the inline styles are made into a class. Let me explain why the style sheet is more suitable for systematic management through a simple example. Let's assume a situation where we need to create another button just like this one. You have to adjust all related properties such as color, margin, padding, font, and so on. However, with the style sheet, it can be done quite easily. Drag the selector from the style sheet pane and drop it on button. Another button with the same style is created. If you look at the class list, you will see a class called button blue. You can remove a class from the class list by clicking the X next to it. When the class was removed, the button returned to its default shape. Let's apply the class in another way this time. Write button blue again in the empty field. Click the add style class to list button. Styles can be applied to UI elements just like dragging the selector. This time, let's assume a situation where we need to change the color of many buttons throughout the UI. If the buttons share a style, it can be solved readily. Select the selector in the style sheet. Change the background color. The change is reflected in all the buttons which share the same style. Because of this reusability and ease of maintenance, style sheets are a key feature of UI Toolkit. Let's go a little further here and use the pseudo class provided by the UI Toolkit to make a visual feedback when the mouse hovers over a button or clicks it. You can define the style of a UI element state by using a pseudo class. This is a list of pseudo classes currently supported by Unity. Here we will use two types, 
Hover, which means the mouse pointer is over the button, and active, which indicates when the button is clicked. To use a pseudo class, add colon after the existing selector and add a pseudo class name. Select the selector and create the appearance of its hover state. I'll increase the scale a bit. Go to transform and increase the scale by 10%. Let's check if hover works well. Even if you don't play the scene, you can check it by using the preview function. It gets bigger each time the mouse pointer hovers over the button. Then I'll make an active pseudo class, which make its color a bit brighter when clicked. The active state also works well. The two states have their own style. There is another way to enrich our visual feedback besides the pseudo class. When a UI element's state or style changes, we can interpolate a property's value. It's the transition animation. Select the selector and go to transition animation. This is where you decide how to animate the value of a particular property when its state changes. The property at the top is where you select a property to apply transition animation to. I'll leave it as all. The followings must be familiar to those who have used Dotween Pro. Duration is the time the transition takes. Easing is the type of easing function, and delay is the time to delay the transition. Leave duration at 0.5 seconds, easing at ease out elastic, and delay at 0 so you can clearly see the animation. Let's check the transition in action. When the pointer moves over the button, the animation plays as expected. Open the USS file. Two pseudo classes have been added. And at the end of the style class, properties related to transition animation are also included. Animations are somewhat exaggerated to show the transition clearly. I'll adjust the animation a little. Set duration to 0.1 and select these out for easing. Also lower the scale increases to 5%. That's all for this video. In the next video, I will introduce how to make a bottom sheet using absolute positioning and animate the UI elements through scripting. Thank you for watching.